This is Windhoek, capital of Namibia in southern Africa. With a complex history of settlement and colonisation, Windhoek still retains many reminders of its German colonial era. Namibia gained independence in 1990, with Dr Sam Nyoma becoming its first president. Sadly, the country has suffered both genocide under German rule and apartheid when the country was under the stewardship of South Africa. 29 years after independence, the townships are still a reminder of that era. Windhoek was the starting point for a 1500 mile journey through Namibia, Botswana and Zimbabwe. Crossing the border into Botswana, I was travelling with 11 other travellers from across the world, with our driver Chris and guide Sandile, both Zimbabweans. We travelled in a truck come minibus over major highways, remote rural roads and dusty desert tracks. Our first stop in Botswana was a lodge run by the San people, also known as the Bushmen, believed to be one of the oldest cultures on earth. The lodge is a project conceived to provide employment for the community, as well as providing an opportunity for the San to share their culture with visitors, as we were treated to some traditional San dancing around the fire. Many of the roads we travelled were badly potholed, giving us the so-called African massage as we bumped and jolted our way along. None more so than the long trek to the banks of the Okavango River. Transferring to a speedboat, we headed a couple of hours downstream, with occasional sightings of crocodiles and plenty of birds for company. Our base for the next two nights was a delightful houseboat which slowly cruised the river each evening. The high vantage point on the boat's top deck was a great platform to watch birds and see the most beautiful sunsets. The next morning we travelled by speedboat and truck to a part of the delta still flooded. On the way we encountered a number of elephants who share the space with the farmed animals belonging to the local villages. One of the things we quickly learned was how well an animal weighing a few tons can hide itself behind a bush. We were taken out onto the delta in Makoros, dugout canoes, which were poled by local guides. Using channels through the grass ploughed out by hippos, we got a real hippo's eye view of the delta and the variety and quantity of bird life that it supports. After a while, we found some of the local hippos taking advantage of a deeper part of the wetlands. We kept our distance. Hippos have been known to quietly swim underneath Makoros and rapidly surface, breaking the Makoro in two and depositing its passengers into the water where the hippo then tries to kill them. They were much more of a threat than the crocodile sunning itself on a nearby bank while the villagers cattle graze nearby. Spending time on the Okavango was a real highlight for me. Having enjoyed natural history documentaries about the River Delta and its annual flood cycle, which draws a significant amount of wildlife to the area, it was very special to be here. After a second night on the houseboat and a speedboat ride back up the river, it was another long couple of days on the road. Driving through the national parks of the salt pans, we were treated to our first sightings of zebra, accompanied of course by a joke about zebra crossings. We also had to stop to let a giraffe slowly and elegantly cross ahead of us. Watching giraffes feeding was a good opportunity to see their ossicones, antler-like growths on their heads, made from cartilage and covered in skin and fur, unlike the bare, bone-based horns of other animals. Also playing chicken, at a much faster pace than the giraffes, were ostrich. A 
Arriving in the village of Guetta, we were taken by four-wheel drive vehicles into the dusty bush of the Kalahari Desert, on the way stopping to see a mighty baobab tree with its robust trunk. Many miles from a paved road, we encountered a tiny village which marked the start of the barren margins of the Mahadi Hadi Pans. Our goal was to find meerkats, which we eventually did after quite a lot of seemingly aimless driving around. Meerkats eat a variety of creatures that many animals wouldn't dare go near, including scorpions, which is possibly what this meerkat has just dug out the ground. The Mahadi Hadi Pans are one of the largest salt flats in the world, formed from the evaporation of Lake Mahadihadi tens of thousands of years ago. There are several separate pans covering a total area of 6,200 square miles. For us, it was a great place to have a drink and watch the sunset. The next day, we arrived at Chobe National Park in time for an evening game drive. Heading down the hill towards the Chobe River, we were treated to sightings of impala, warthogs, hippos, elephants, and numerous species of birds. Chobe was Botswana's first national park and originally home to the San people. It's generally recognized as having the highest concentration of game in all of Africa. The river's floodplain is a magnet for many species of animals, including large herds of impala, cape buffalo, and perhaps most impressively, elephants. Seeing a herd of many dozen crossing the grassy plain, kicking up dust into the light of the setting sun, is nothing short of spectacular. Amongst the bird life here are vultures and the huge marabou stork, the latter also known as the undertaker bird. These have wingspans that can exceed 12 feet and are scavengers alongside the vultures. Chobe is known for having lions which prey on small elephants. We were lucky enough to see a pride waking up from their afternoon siesta and slowly making their way down to the river. Fortunately for the elephants and other potential lion dinners, we didn't see the lions making any kind of attack or kill. However, the impala grazing on the plain was certainly aware of the lion's presence. Dawn and dusk are the best times to see wildlife here, with the middle of the day being too hot for them or us to be out. Therefore, we had an early start the following morning to head back into the park to see what else we could find. The first new animal was this jackal. After seeing some young male impala practicing fighting, we encountered a troop of baboons, one of the most entertaining animals to watch. Baboons are very social animals and generally live to an age of 20 to 30 years. Driving around the park, we saw several carcasses, no doubt a mixture of predatory activity and natural death. But with so many scavengers around, nothing will go to waste. Heading back out of the park, we encountered a large herd of elephants heading towards the river. Quite likely the same group we saw headed the other way the previous evening. Thank you. 
Our final foray into Chobe was on the river as the sun was starting to set. This was a great chance to get close to crocodiles and get a better look at the buffalo and hippos that were enjoying the grassy islands in the river. most impressive was watching our large elephant herd leaving one of the islands, walking and swimming across the river to head back into the forest. An amazing spectacle at any time, but even more so when seen from river level. When it came to quantity and diversity of wildlife, Chobe did not disappoint. Leaving Chobe and entering Zimbabwe, we got an aerial view of Victoria Falls. The falls are over a mile wide, but I visited during the dry season when water flows over just a part of this width. However, this year was drier than most, and therefore the amount of water cascading over the basalt rock was even more reduced, but still impressive, with drops of over 300 feet. Getting closer to the falls showed just how dry much of the width is, but the constant thundering noise and spray was a reminder that there was still a huge volume of water moving towards the Indian Ocean. Above part of the falls is Devil's Pool, an area where a rock barrier makes a relatively safe pool where tourists can bathe just feet away from the precipice. Victoria Falls marked the end of my journey from Namibia to Zimbabwe. This was my first visit to Africa, and as the tour guide and the t-shirt say, visiting Africa is not a holiday, it's an adventure.